वन मिनट we go live in uh, another 1 minute is 4 229 so we go live at 230 youtube is uh, recording it it also yes sir youtube is recording so we go live now yeah very warm welcome to all of you and our distinguished panels who are joining us for the second day of surface engineering and corrosion control online conference which is taking place at oil gas and power integrated exhibition and conference welcome to all the delegates who are streaming in live this entire conference this is the second day of surface engineering and corrosion control we had a very very interactive session yesterday where we had more than 350 people out of 500 people who were during the live stream we had very interactive and knowledgeable inaugural session and followed by the session 1 which we concluded yesterday today we are very very much delighted to have with us mr batra sir the convener and advisor chukuku paints he has been a guiding force for the entire event and also he was the guiding force for us first edition which we did in february during the kemtech i so with this i would formally like to welcome batra sir to set the tone for the second day batra sir what is sir thank you mr nagar thank you very much for the kind words uh, yesterday i started with saying that we have reached a situation of inflection point and the presentations which were made yesterday Uh, proved my hypothesis to be correct uh, all the presentations were of future technologies the technologies which are making a big difference to the uh, user industry and the user industry uh, uh, participants also showed great interest in accepting the technologies i think uh, those days have gone where we were very happy with five year performance seven year performance we are now looking for 10 year to 40 years performance of uh, paint and coatings and i think the uh, the interactions were yesterday excellent and i'm sure today also so i'll not stand between uh, the participants the delegates and the presenters i'll uh, want to uh, invite uh, i want to thank all the participants both the faculty as well as the uh, delegates for the keen interest they have shown so uh welcome all of you and please go ahead with the first presentation i think i'll hand it over back to mr nagar thank you sir thank you batra sir for the opening remarks before we start formally the uh, conference i think it is very important that we acknowledge all the partners all the exhibitors and the sponsors without whom this entire event would not have taken place so on the live screen we would like to uh, i'm just quick glance that we are sharing all the partners who were supported right from the principal partners to the title partners the co title partners the platinum partners gold silver bronze and support partners each of them in their own way are displaying their products to so do visit the exhibitor section to see the latest videos to interact one to one with them and really it will be helping in what the center platform is for the business networking and the business chatting and having one to one meetings now obviously there are multiple conferences taking place at the platform so thanks to all the partners with this i would now formally move to the session 2 of the entire program session 2 which was focusing today on the protection of assets on oil gas and power industry so we have with us today mr dinesh kumar from ongc iot mr tl madhusudan pongel mr sekhar joshi from chukuku paints and mr tarun mishra from detect technologies we also had one more speaker mr rajiv mankar but there is an uh, vaccination drive going on in uh, right now in lakshmi narayan institute so he is unable to join today but he is sending us a recorded presentation which we will stream 
and send it to all. With this, I would like to formally introduce our first speaker, Mr. Dinesh Kumar, DGM Head, IOT ONGC. Mr. Dinesh Kumar assumed charge as the head of the Institute IOT from 24th May 2021. He joined ONGC as a graduate trainee way back in 1985 and has worked extensively in the engineering services, plants and erstwhile technical business group. A civil engineering graduate from Punjab Engineering College, Chandigarh, MBA from IGNU in marketing. He has more than 35 years of rich experience in diverse activities of ONGC. With this, I will now like to invite Mr. Dinesh Kumar for his address. Welcome on board, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and IOT in this esteemed conference. It's a great, uh, really indeed a great pleasure for me to present a key note speech on protection of assets, oil, gas, and power industry in this international integrated energy show. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Surface Engineering and Corrosion Control 2021. I appreciate the commitment of the organizer in the disseminating the knowledge and promoting R&D activities on corrosion control. Corrosion costs cost the globe billions of dollars each year. Some of the statistics highlight that the corrosion is impacting 4.2% of India's GDP and the menace requires urgent appropriate measures. It is very often reported that internationally, one ton of steel turns into rust every 90 seconds. And about 50% of the steel produced the world over is used to replace rusted steel. Therefore, it is paramount to control corrosion, not only to reduce loss of assets and associated risk, but also from sustainability point of view. Steel production is not only an energy intensive process, but the production has a huge carbon footprint. Experts opine that the cost of corrosion can be reduced by about 40% through uses of corrosion resistant material, advanced surface coatings, and application of best corrosion related practices. ENP companies like ours operate in a high risk environment and can least afford to take on the added risk of failure due to corrosion. A large number of the unforeseen incidents that occur in process plants are related to corrosion. Our fields are getting older, and with the passage of time, some reservoirs are producing both CO2 and H2S, along with increase in water cut. This also has become a great challenge for the corrosion genius. As we are expanding ourselves to near horizon like deep sea, exploitation of gas hydrates, new AOR techniques, visualizations, in situ combustion, cyclic steam stimulation, etc., more challenges related to use of proper materials and stringent corrosion management will crop up. It needs a good cohesion among design and material engineers as well as corrosion specialists for effective corrosion management. We spend a very huge amount on painting of our coastal plants at Hazira and Uran. Another area where we spend a considerable sum per annum on paint is for protect, protection of above water offshore structures. The painting on offshore platforms has another important aspect that is marine spread and scaffolding, et cetera which take a major chunk of cost of painting offshore structures. We would like to have paint formulations and procedures which can reduce painting frequency. More work on self-healing paints and coatings will definitely bring down the painting frequency and will help in saving our assets and cost also. An important component of obtaining a thorough understanding <clears throat> of corrosion science and prevention technique is knowledge sharing between industries and scholars throughout the world 
I am sure this international conference will provide an active platform for everyone to present new ideas, to understand corrosion technologies, and to enhance their decision-making process to combat corrosion. I wish a grand success to this conference of importance to industry, the nation, and the globe. Thank you very much. Sir, with me is my colleague, uh, Mausmi Kakoti. She is our head uh, material and corrosion. We will like to present our some few slides. Please. Shall I go ahead with the presentation? Yes, you can go ahead. This is uh, uh, corrosion in oil and gas industries, whatever we are doing in IoT, just small glimpse. Like uh, Sir has already talked about cost of corrosion and its impact uh, in Indian uh, scenario. This is the, uh, these are the reasons of failure uh, due to corrosion in our industry. Uh, this general corrosion, heating, then stress corrosion cracking, since we have uh, H2S atmosphere. So there, there are uh, some cases of stress corrosion cracking, then uh, crevice cracking, then erosion, uh, intergranular embrittlement and fatigue. Uh, these are very small, but general pitting and SCC uh, takes the major role. Uh, we can see that the equipment failures in oil and gas industry, it is mostly is due to corrosion. And uh, other region, reasons are uh, lesser in percentage. Then uh, causes of corrosion of uh, corrosion failures in oil and in gas industry are uh, due to presence of CO2 mostly due to presence of CO2, then H2S, then uh, there are preferential well corrosion, pitting corrosion, then erosion, then galvanic type corrosion, crevice, and impingement, and uh, stress corrosion. These are the various, uh, uh, there are in the entire oil and gas industry, we experience corrosion in some way or other, like in, uh, if there is saccharod wells, in the all the sphere of our application is a great challenge for us. Here, as example, you can see that uh, there is crude oil storage tank. It is near GGS uh, Calvary asset, uh, where you can uh, that it got evaporated and then it's called top line corrosion and then condensed moisture on the oil tank it uh, suffered corrosion. Uh, Presence of gases and all they are make the water an aggressive electrolyte. Then its flow velocity is another uh, issue. If it has a low velocity, like less than one meter per second, then there is stagnation of water, then this causes corrosion. Then material composition, temperature, pressure, and the water quality issues are there, like including pH, then presence of microbes. This is a, a very vital issue uh, cropping up nowadays. Then uh, concentration of bicarbonate chloride as well as organic acid is now uh, we, we find uh, traces of organic acids in our produced fluids due to the presence of microbes, which are also causing um, corrosion in our lines. Here are some case studies. There's a failed segment of high pressure gas pipelines like we have gas lift wells and where uh, we uh, 
transport gas uh, through these lines to our wells. And there was a uh, fail, uh, like a sleet was observed in this line. And then cause was like high, there was high CO2 was there. And also there is under deposit corrosion. I told you that flow is another big issue. That was, it has segregated flow and uh, microbial activity was also observed. So the, it was recommended to do the health assessment of wall thickness and hydro test of full portion of pipeline. This continuous injection of corrosion inhibitor was recommended as well as uh, biocide was, uh, uh, continuous dosing of biocide was uh, recommended. And the, uh, minimizing the moisture would uh, definitely do a great help to this because it is the moisture content in the gas which has uh, got, I mean, got settled down in that six o'clock position. And ERW, it, it had a seam, ERW seam, so it actually failed through the seam and it was uh, should be positioned in 12 o'clock position to minimize uh, and the corrosion. Another study was also a failed segment of pipeline of uh, a GGS. Here also we can see that it failed through the uh, seam and uh, it is due to preferential well corrosion. And then uh, it had a stratified uh, flow pattern and the pH was very low, 5.5. Uh, and then there was uh, stringers, inclusions were also uh, present in the material uh, along with microbial, though microbial activity was not much, but it has also because these lines failed in two years. So all these together had caused this failure. Then we also here in, uh, recommended the treatment of corrosion inhibitor and biocide and replacement of ERW well seam at six o'clock should be strictly avoided. Here also it was in six o'clock position and LRUT survey, it was recommended to carry out LRUT survey and to understand the health of the line. Another was that a failed sample of HPHD service water. And there was a, a hole was observed and it, and it failed. It was also preferential attack on the well area and they're causing the, uh, and there was porosity in the, when it was done X-ray diffractor, X-ray study was carried out. It was found that there was porosity in the seam and uh, there also we found the presence of uh, microbes. So um, here also we recommended to use seamless pipes and uh, GRE pipe uh, can be also be used with caution because it is uh, prone to mechanical damage and uh, dosing of bactericide was uh, recommended. Here another flange failure was there, which was uh, actually there was misalignment during the welding and, uh, and there was some sand ingression, ingress also along with the fluid of the well, which has caused uh, erosion damage to this and uh, flow assisted corrosion was there. We have recommended to use uh, tungsten carbide uh, uh, coated uh, flange and reducer material. And, um, and considering this frequent failure, we have asked them to make all 22 chrome duplex stainless steel for entire flow arm, uh, and then to take precaution during welding. And to give some sand control uh, are, is also recommended. Here is another that uh, failed flow line sample was there. Here also there was defect in weld so uh, penetration, uh, lack of penetration and lack of fusion in the wellman was observed and there was misalignment. And here it is uh, very high salinity was there. So there in the crevice had formed during in this lack of uh, penetration and lack of fusion areas. And it has uh, caused this crevice corrosion. Uh, so welding, we have recommended to do the welding properly with proper WPS and uh, best treatment of corrosion inhibitor was also suggested. 
some uh, this is since this uh, conference is mainly on surface protection so we use uh, cathodic protection in uh, another like we protect our uh, uh, underwater uh, and also on uh, on shore lines uh, through cathodic protection um, we are, we was either through sacrificial anode method or impressed current, current method it does not eliminate corrosion it transfer corrosion from one structure to uh, under protection to a known location where artificial anodes are placed and could be replaced easily then cathodic protection is used for floating vessels platforms storage tanks pipelines and all cathodic protection principle is based on the electrochemical nature of the corrosion phenomena and the anodic area corrodes and the cathodic area that doesn't corrode that cathodic protection overrides the naturally occurring anodic area inside the structure, thus turning the structure under protection completely cathodic, which means it receives current from surrounding electrolyte and it doesn't corrode. So in a, like there is a sacrificial uh, anode and that our pipeline uh, acts as a cathode in the moist soil, and when this sacrificial anode uh, is uh, depleted, then we replace them with uh, fresh anodes. Similarly, we do it for underwater structures also, uh, where we cannot, uh, the paint, where the paint cannot uh, do the uh, protection, here it is supplemented by cathodic protection. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Ms. Moshmi, and thank you, Mr. Kumar. Uh, you can unshare the screen. Hello. And thank you for your wonderful uh, uh, presentation and explaining the corrosion mitigation and the problems in corrosion. We will take the Q&A uh, after once we have completed this session. So thank you. And now we would like to move to the next speaker for today. I would like to invite now Mr. T. L. Madhusudan, DGM station in charge, LPG booster station of Gale, an electrical graduate engineer having rich experience of 28 years in various segments like handling of natural gas and LPG, solar power and wind energy. LPG is one of the most dangerous hydrocarbon which is having dual phase properties. Various innovative steps have been taken in the field of operations and infrastructure safety. His lecture title is Causes of Internal and External Corrosions in Cross-Country Pipelines and its Prevention. With this, I would like to now invite Mr. Madhusudan. Mr. Madhusudan? Yes, sir. It's over to you. Uh, yeah. Sir, good afternoon to everybody, uh, to all the team members. And I, give, I very much thanks to the Chemtech for the Surface Engineering Control 2021 conference and uh, giving a time to, to present my paper on this AC interference and its corrosion, which is a typical corrosion take place. And um, the, now it just uh, it is started in the, in the field of corrosion. The, the people are st still they are doing a study the how to mitigate further in the uh, effective way. But it, this has been started, I think, in the year 2015. This is with full flight. It has been taken place. And many of them has came to know that their corrosion will take place with high tension transmission lines, which uh, where the cross-country pipeline cross the uh, intersects the and cross the this pipeline, uh, this uh, line, uh, the overhead lines. And we, wherever this lines crosses behind the power stations, substations, is a very great, great influence will be there on the corrosion. And this is been observed in our in our one of the pipeline, and I will share you this uh, one of the my case study which has happened in the Gale that uh, for the uh, the knowledge sharing, and uh, I'm going to share this my paper. So this is an AC interference and its corrosion. And basically, AC interference takes place with the, with the electric magnetic field created AC power changes like the frequency 50 times per second per phase and metallic structures subject to change their electromagnetic field with exhibit to an induced voltage. And thereby, the current will be induced. 
and face to the ground falls will be very prone to the, the high tension lines. And this is a typical study we have noted by how, when the initiation, how the AC interference has been notified during the regular PSP monitoring. You see that when the when we take on the on off survey, there are the little bit peaks of going on beyond that one point five volts and is a drastically again reducing to the below point eight. And with this, we have suspected that something is going on. Some other than the DC voltage, some AC also is being uh, is overlapping in the DC uh, in the DC level. So the to uh, further investigate, we have been gone to the data loggers. The, with the DC data logger, again, we have gone with the monitoring with the 24 hours logging. Then we have seen that, that the voltage at certain time, it is going beyond up to the reaching up to the two volts. See the graph. See, the, this is a graph at so particular time only. This is a, uh, this time only it is being crossing uh, more than two volts, the DC volts. Then we thought that some, uh, there is a AC also is in, maybe it's overlapping. Then we have uh, gone into the uh, study, the, what are the AC interference, how the AC interference will take place. And this is a typical types of surveys and mitigations have been carried out for the AC interference. This, um, we have done the soil resistivity, high voltage transmission lines, the model of the AC, individual, AC and fault currents, AC interference mitigation and designs, AC protection from the capital coupling, inductive coupling and resistive coupling. And this is a computer modeling. Nowadays, the one uh, software has been developed in which the, we can, uh, once uh, data is faded into the system, it gives the suspecting uh, the AC interference take place the where uh, the vulnerable location. That will be clearly by the software modeling. It will, it will detect and give the exact change and uh, particular point there we require to, where we require to take the mitigations. So this is uh, where the, how the, uh, influence has been taking place. This is a typical one uh, taken from the, the site and uh, how the interference will take place the use the, when the transmission lines is above ground and underground is uh, underneath of the ground, our natural gas pipelines are being played and how the induced voltage is happening. And this is uh, one of the, we have taken the, this, we have the standard guidelines, the wherever the crossing is take place, it will, we need to put uh, some insulation mat and PCC and grounding conductor for which where the accidentally when the conductor falls on the ground that that current should not induce in the in the in the pipeline where if it is induced and immediately there would be chances of puncture of the pipeline. This is a resistive coupling, and this is the data logging take place taken place by the AC voltage. Once we took the AC voltage uh, data, you see that the, the, the where the, the DC voltage is going more than the two volts, then we have suspected and we have done the, this AC, AC survey by data logging. Then we have seen that the enormous voltage is being injecting into the pipeline. See, that is a maximum up to 157.32 AC voltage is, is being injecting into the pipeline. So there is a huge uh, amount of uh, voltage uh, is uh, developing in the pipeline, and uh, it is causing the damage of the pipeline. So then I will come into the subse subsequent slides how the it is causing the damage in the pipeline. So this is uh, what uh, current density has taken place with the one putting the one square centimeter of the coupon of the similar pipe material in the adjacent to the pipeline and measure the current density, and the current density is going up to the three thousand one twenty five. Um, amps per square centimeter. This is not uh, recommended. It's uh, as per the guide, NACE guidelines, it is recommended only 30 amps per square meter. So this is a uh, typical guidelines what should be the current density. The, for the corrosion does not occur in the AC density less than 20 amps and AC corrosion unpredictable when it is uh, between 20 to 100 and if AC corrosion occurs when it is going beyond the 100 amps per square centimeter. So this is the voltages where the with various changes, the where the we during the ILI, subsequently we do the ILI also in our pipeline periodically. And we have in the ILI report, we got that uh, enormous uh, anomalies, the where the external corrosion took place up to the beyond 50%. So that is a huge uh, alarming to us 
that where the and this is a coinciding where the this are transmission lines where uh, where the high transmission lines are crossing there only this uh, 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 this metal loss been occurred on the pipeline see these are the metal losses see this is a uh, where the after removing the coating we have seen that uh, what is the, the cause of corrosion? This is a, how the AC current, AC corrosion take place. This is only a, just like a 10 mm hole, 10 mm dia, and there will be a carbon deposition is formed. Once it is cleaned, then there will be a depth of uh, the almost 50% of the metal, of the thickness of the pipe will be eroded. See, this is a way how the, the depth has been formed after removing the car carbon. So the physically the uh, how the uh, typically when the study comes taken place the the AC current corrosion take place where the soil resistivity is is acidic means it is going beyond the eight, uh, seven and it is recording the eight point one five and the material uh, the material uh, collection during the picking there's a large amount of iron content is been forming in the eighty five point nine four. This is a material which is being collected during the picking also. This is the assessment is being done during the AC corrosion. Then the, how the mitigation take place that I'll come to the this uh, no, next program. See now later we, we have taken the mitigations at all HT crossings in this way that putting the PCC and the mat and the grounding conductor and so that to wherever the, the uh, AC voltage induced in the pipeline immediately it will drain into the Again, back to the earth. That is the main our idea. See, this is a what the AC voltage dropped from 9.26 volts to 1.88, and grounding resistance has been dropped to 0.68 ohms after uh, installing this. This is called a polarization cell, where this is a conductive method, where the when the AC voltage in, induced immediately it will conduct and it will drain into the earth and it will stop the DC voltage. This is a typical diagram how the, uh, the stray currents are inducing into the pipeline and how it is getting drained. And this is a uh, geographical uh, one, uh, typical uh, how the study is, uh, AC interference is taking place. And this is our pipeline. And this is our tier in it, where the DC is cathodic protection system. The, basically it is taking place from the anode to the cathode. And this is our above-ground instruments that like a pressure, pressure transmitter and pressure gauge. And normally it will be a 1.2 volts of the pipeline, or the negative 1.2 volt, the CP will be protected. And when the, the transmission line comes above the our pipeline, then the induction takes place. And then see the, how the voltage is raised. Once I induce the voltage is occurred in the pipeline, it is increasing to the 190 volts. And to overcome from this, we have done the connecting one method of the polarization cell and connecting to the earth. Simply grounding the current back to the earth. And once we ground the current, it comes to the back to the 1.2 volt. And then the causes of the, the AC corrosion take place with the transmission lines and uh, so substations and AC traction. These are the three are the vulnerable for the cross country pipeline for the causing the external corrosion. This is a very silent corrosion, doesn't give any much. Uh, impact on the pipeline and very gradually it will eat away the pipeline. This is a typical study after the mitigation, see the DC interference before the mitigation, how the interference is occurring on the pipeline. We will never come to know on which, for which cause it is happening the interference. Once we connected the, the after the mitigation, see that the, the PSP values are we make them it become like a constant DC voltage. 
and uh, we have put up for the above ground protection we have introduced the one dielectric fitting so that for the protection of the the woman whenever the uh, the person working on the uh, the above ground piping structures like walls and uh, the, uh, the pressure transmitters pressure gauges and that uh, to avoid this uh, stray currents they are we have kept one dielectric media so that it will stop the ac voltage and dc current coming into the instrument and these are the typical mitigation like this is called a clock spring wherever the, the metal loss is happening we are putting the clock springs and the results after the ht crossings the grounding conductor the ac voltage have been reduced drastically this is a red line where there is after the mitigation has come down drastically and this is a resistance the effectiveness of this ac voltage mitigation and lessons learned that how to do how to go ahead and how to monitor it these are the method steps to be taken considered to be taken into the note the conclusion is that the pipe to soil potential is very close and the soil may not be adequate to in a in a indicating ac interference issues as a pipeline is a very good coating and well susceptible to the ac interference in case pipeline corridor is selected parallel to the ac transmission lines suitable mitigation measures should be provided since construction of the pipeline itself and ac interference is one of the issue which can lead to the significant damage to the pipelines in the short span of time considering the huge consequential loss in the case of the pipe failure in the case of oil and gas pipelines the policy maker should consider the segregating the pipeline corridors from the pipeline corridors power line corridors and existing protection mechanism are costly are costly as well as a point to the damages and vandalism if the pipeline operators provide these mechanism they do not last long and this is a need to make this mechanism more robust and vulnerable proof interference interference survey should be also be carried out periodically interval to confirm the adequacy as well as healthiness of the interference protection mechanism and these are the reference which are taken place from the to uh, made the presentation thank you very much thank you mr madhusudan uh, for the very important topic which uh, in advisory board meetings when we had we people had talked about causes of internal and external corrosion in cross country pipelines thank you again thank you now sir. we would like to move over to our uh, next speaker for the day mr shekhar joshi managing director chukuku paints private limited he has had a very long stint being a managing director of chukuku paints india private limited which is a subsidiary of chukuku marine paints singapore pt limited from april 2004 till date he has also worked as an india license office from january 2005 to march 2014 before that he has worked with chukuku jensen and nicholson and sigma coatings which is now ppg asian paints and in grand foundry which is huge experience and decade of experience in the paint and coating industry with this i would now like to formally announce and hand over to mr shekhar joshi his lecture title is underwater coatings for applications especially in tidal zones and coastal zones over to you sir uh, thank you mr nagar thank you mr sir and uh, all the dignitaries uh, uh, from iot from the guild uh, everyone uh, is my voice is audible properly it is audible okay i will share my screen now and uh, we we'll go immediately to the presenting part um, just just i just open the screen first and then some kind of problem in uh, connectivity i don't know why but uh, it was not getting connected something some issues were there so i believe uh, during my presentation it should not happen so uh, let's move on with this just hold on sometimes technology gives lot of uh, issues to you 
and uh, yeah. is beyond your control yes so yes uh, so yes. it is it is uh, yeah. it is now open uh, 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 yes this one uh, uh, you will you able to see properly yeah. yeah yes yes okay, i'll put it in thank you very much uh, everyone good afternoon again uh, my name is shikhar doshi and i'm working as a uh, managing director for chibuku paints india private limited so today's topic is quite different because uh, uh, this is an ignored topic i can say and many people ignore this uh, due to various circumstances which we'll see later on during my presentation so just a new brief uh, introduction uh, this is a 100 year old plus company we have uh, this is i think more than 4 year of operations of chigoku paints and we are from japan uh, one of the most uh, quality share and uh, developed nation in the world so this is our website chigokucmpchigoku.com global chigoku paints india primary is a 100% subsidy of uh, cmp pan because we form from the as uh, mr nagar said we are from singapore so our parents are singapore and their parents are in japan so that is how we are linked with japan with 100% as a subsidiary we have a complete setup in india to cater your needs in mumbai we have fully functional office operations with the technical support cell support and everything uh, based in mumbai so but let's see what is the background because what happens uh, under what structures mainly which are fixed offshore structures like a uh, platforms or platforms jt piles bridges also because we have uh, bridges like the washi bridge in mumbai there is also some of the sea bridges being built on a creek or some sort of it i can say and these are located in pretty very severe environments and for long period of time most of this structure need a regular uh, i can say maintenance after the initial construction period because what happens when we uh, they, uh, when any structure we build in offshore or anywhere in a sea naturally uh, wear and tear is going to happen uh, which is the way it is but uh, uh, We need a, a, a regular maintenance for that. Generally, visible areas that is atmospheric zone, which is open and can see, space zone, which again can be, can be visible, are being maintained very regularly, but which they catches immediate attention. But unfortunately, I can say, unfortunately, the underwater zone, the tidal zone, are being ignored due to the various reasons. The reasons can be a number of reasons. I am just giving some of the reasons which are given below. The reasons could be cost. because again the cost is very important for the budgets you are not budgeted for that in the previous budget so again this very big expenditure availability of time the resources uh, shut down is there or whatever may be cases are there so resources are not available entirely internal approvals is again a big question mark uh, internals non availability of the skilled inspectors and also the sea conditions etc etc in the government sector the change of officer also big problem it breaks the continuity and hence delays the process i came across uh, very this example which we approached this uh, this uh, government sector in 2011 and 12 and uh, later on in 21 they said no i was working on this, but i left after that no one taken care of that that was the scenario and that was one of the biggest you can say heart line of mumbai breach i can say but that is the uh, the scenario some structures of jetty piles i am giving for jetty piles right now yes uh, there can be structures of offshore structures but this is basically we are showing for jetty piles this is recent pictures what we have can you see this this is normal this is a splash zone area splash zone area is how much is corroded just imagine what will be the main level area or the tidal zone area so this the uh, basically the scenario in most of the jetty piles in india the offshore platforms also and also the bridges heavy cost of ignorance for the underwater and tidal zone that is also very unfortunate part in india any asset owner apply the paint at the lowest tide level what happens the paints are available of every category the people like us also can convince why don't you Why do you go with uh, such a high cost? You can apply it. I don't know. It can be taken care of. Don't worry for it. So the officer also says, "Yes, yes. What what you say is right." So, but ignore the most vulnerable part, which is the main sea level and below, where humidity can reach and which can catch the barnacle growth. 
this thing has been ignored because we are from the marine paint of supply shipping industry so we know the importance of uh, barnacle and how it can deteriorate the substrate survey also might ignore because they do all of these deep piles on a sampling basis in most of the cases they don't go on each and every pile and see uh, look at this that is also one of the urgent part because they have a time limit they have budgets and they go and they say okay okay, okay let's see this jet units of the lng lpg petroleum products need to be more concerned about the jet piles with regard to the corrosion prevention due to types of cargoes and also the stringent requirements of charters this happens basically mainly with uh, uh, the uh, the uh, i can say high end uh, lng and lpg carriers also the uh, the tires because of the risk which is involved in this which need to be uh, no uh, which need to be very concerned about such kind of risk but uh, regular periodic maintenance is must to avoid any consequences but what happens what happens as i mentioned earlier in the previous slides that sometimes it get ignored sometimes it will not be considered uh, x reasons y reasons z reasons uh, that is how uh, it it uh, it goes to both post code thing but uh, if you want to the maintenance of these things properly things can go haywire chupa has a very innovative solution for underwater sewerable epoxy coating which has to be applied by divers some of the products are there in market i can say which uh, they go up to the main sea level without the help of divers but cannot go under the water cannot go under the water let's show these are a product name called permaster wv300 i'll just show you brief the brochure how it can uh, you can see the brochure and uh, is visible brochure is can you open see the link okay yes, yeah so this is a unique material coating for underwater and this called permaster wv series we have two products in this one is for the one is for the underwater area completely that is below 1 meter down the line uh, from the mean sea level and one is basically for the uh, one is basically uh, for the uh, up to 5 uh, no uh, uh, up to 0.5 meter second so is that uh, which uh, which you can see on this but it is flash zone tag zone and underwater zone so there are three zones which we have shown so we have two products for underwater zone which is completely underwater zone submerged completely all the time which is below 1 meter down from the mean sea level the tidal zone is basically which comes between the 0.5 to you know from the zero level to say 1 meter 0.5 or 0.75 meters but below that is purely underwater uh, area so what we have is called permaster wv200 and permaster wv300 and these are basically the uh, the way it goes uh, no this is the the just brochure and i will show you again the pictures uh, how it been applied and everything i'll show you uh, this is i thought i just show you this brochure this product chuko has from last 30 years the brochure is not seeable we can't see the brochure you cannot see the brochure no only the heading is there uh, okay then i will cancel this i'll cut this okay okay sorry then sorry because this is a pdf so i was i have put uh, the hyping of the pdf and i was trying to do that but uh, i think then uh, the pdf episode uh, got open unfortunately i'm sorry for that okay okay let's back underwater curable epoxy coating is epoxy based products and chugugu has this product for last 30 years from last 3 decades more than 3 decades i can 3.5 decades can say it's a three component epoxy based product based hardener and lead as i was mentioning in the in the uh, in the my the brochure which which unfortunately could not get open uh, there are two uh, uh, two products what we can have like which is basically for tidal zone which is from the mean sea level to say 0.5 meters and the other one is the complete underwater product underwater zone you can say which has been used for the permaster wv300 okay which has to be applied in proportion as per the technical data sheet of the product yes because otherwise things can go haywire and things can go wrong with if it is not done. 
this is a typical solvent-less epoxy or solvent-free epoxy because uh, this is solvent-free epoxy product, I can say. Because uh, so there is no question of environment uh, uh, anything in this because uh, the green organisms or whatever the fish we can say because Japan is an island nation and purely dependent on ship fish. So this is used extensively in Japan uh, and that is why the, uh, the product is totally solid with epoxy. How it works is very uh, good. Uh, I can say the mechanism of performance is there is a substrate which is the down, uh, I can say, which I have to substrate under the water. Then we apply an uh, undercoat. I'll explain you how it, uh, how we apply and how we do it in, this, in the subsequent slide. I'll explain to you. And I'm just uh, showing you how the paint gets uh, you know, uh, applied uh, and how it uh, forces away the water. Because it takes away the water out and get paints get applied on the substrate. So that is why it's called uh, the adhesion mechanism is very important in such paint. And we have a huge track record for this kind of paint application. So underwater curable epoxy system feature, just wanted to show you some features, salient features of this. Excellent water in the water, in the water. Excellent adhesion to the bed surfaces, yes, it is. Solid, long-term durability because it can go for around 20, 15 to 20 years in between, depending on the sea condition. But uh, I can say minimum 15, maximum 20, you can say. Beyond that, we of course, we need to check every time uh, with the periodic thing. Now, uh, it is also NORSOC approved system because uh, in North Sea, in North sea in basically the, in the North Sea uh, uh, offshore area, this product is highly accepted and approved by the NORSOC system also. So I believe the India will not be the problem as far as the application uh, of the product and acceptable in the product system. It's a non-toxic, non-containment con uh, coating system. So no pollution for the marine life plus is eco-friendly, which I mentioned to you earlier. So that it is a solid free epoxy product. So no question arising when any pollution or anything comes from this, even it is submerged in the water. Being applicable under the water without degrading the performance. CMP experience is more than 30 years, as I mentioned to you earlier. This is very important. How you do it? Underwater curable epoxy just a simple procedure. There is no, you don't need other than divers, uh, the separate thing. But of course, divers and marine spray uh, and uh, this is the largest requirement you for the paint. Scrapping and removal of the marine growth or whatever the corrosion you have on this, you have to do that first. Blasting, it can be do the SA 2.5 blasting with a, a slurry blasting, you can say, uh, with the sand and the mixture of the sand and water. It can be done. There's a pre-treatment. Uh, you can put some kind of jelly uh, on that uh, so that there is any kind of slime or something sort of in which cannot uh, come on the substrate. Affliction of undercoat. Pre-treat again just to apply and just clean the whole thing uh, 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 after the blasting. We, we just clean after the first coat also undercoat, which is around 450 microns, which is around 450 microns for Permasa 300. Uh, then a the pre-treatment we have to do. Uh, they clean the mopping and everything again that area so that there is no uh, foreign element which is in their part of that uh, other than the uh, the sea water you can say or the, or the other than the water application of the finished coat and the final inspection by Chugoku Hospital we can also have the inspector uh, who can be there with diver with a camera the owner also can uh, appoint the, the inspection team along with a uh, diving team who has to be a diving team because it has to be seen under the water and uh, on the above, on the ground on the on the surface surface on the on the ground level you can have the screen monitoring which can be uh, linked with the cam inside uh, on, uh, inside the uh, application area so it can be monitored quite well uh, there are no issues and we have enough example of this and we have done it also so uh, likewise, uh, we do the underwater photography of the ships and uh, they do the surveys and everything. So this kind of technique is the same thing will applicable here also. So surface preparation is blasting, as I mentioned to you, to S5, ISO 8501, remote running uh, of marine adhesives and everything is there. Underwater epoxy coating under coat, 1 into 450 microns of DFT because it's a thick paint and it has to be applied in that manner. Removal of contaminants, again, I mentioned to you that uh, what contamination this comes on the substrate, we have to remove it so that uh, the adhesion can be properly. And then finish paint with the 600 microns. This is for the Permasur 300. 
per master 200 is basically uh, i think 100 microns less than this uh, and uh, that is how the because there's a difference between the two products uh, which is basically uh, the tidal zone and underwater zone which i mentioned to you so these are basically i can say the specifications for the painting so it can the application by travel as well uh, you know the, it cannot go with the airless spray inside this and uh, you have to have the deep sea diver uh, who has the good capacity to stay in the water is very important for us and uh, uh, water temperature means uh, I, uh, even if it is a summer or like in india the water temperature can go uh, high but in if you see in north sea the temperature can go uh, no below 5 degrees so below 5 degrees this cannot be applied but uh, in, as far as we are concerned in india uh, there are no issues at all uh, for the application of such paint. Uh, even though the water temperature goes about 30, 35 degrees, there is an issue. But if it goes below uh, below five, yes, there can be concern uh, of the because the, uh, the of the water temperature. So recommended use for maintenance of underwater tidal zone steel structures. Any any steel structures support harbor facilities such as sheet piles, pile jetties, and uh, all these things. Offshore platforms. Uh, also, the some of the vessels do it. These coatings are excellent uh, strength and compared with the conventional mortar linings and underwater culpable coatings. Because what happens, curable coatings, sorry. So, what happens basically, all, most of the structures are having the coatar epoxy. This can go against with the coatar epoxy, no problem. Of course, we have to do the SAT coatar blasting, and uh, those things are important because we have to remove the coatar epoxy and uh, uh, the age old coating, whichever there is there, we have to remove it. The joints, we have to uh, do proper surface preparation over there because the joints are the area which are more vulnerable, I can say. These are the, for the pictures we have shown up to the 11 years. Uh, this is a typical example uh, in Japan. And these are the piles which are there. You can see there are a lot of barnacles uh, which are being uh, formed. This is an underwater area uh, before the removal of barnacles. This is the growth which has been taken on the pile. This is basically, I think, from Saruga Bay, Japan. And after scrapping out the barnacles and the marine growth, the inside paint film, the inside film remains as it is. There is no change. The structure, your, the, your asset remains as it is. The barnacle may be there from outside, but uh, if, if the structure, if the paint is there properly, an agent is there, naturally barnacles will not uh, penetrate inside and did not reach the, uh, the basic the structure. So these are basically the, the photographs uh, what I can show. We have the video films for this. And uh, uh, I believe uh, if uh, all the asset owners in India, all the asset owners in India look it very cautiously about their own assets because uh, uh, for treaty piles and uh, the offshore platforms and everything, whichever we have, uh, which is owned by the government and also by the private sector, naturally this product can be very useful and which can enhance the life of the asset. The cost benefit analysis can be shown and be explained uh, to any one of you. And we can show you how it can be beneficial, how your asset can be protected for longer time, may not be the replacement cost of the asset, because the asset replacement cost will be very heavy, the, the file replacement cost will be very heavy, or such things, you know, you know it well. So it's better to take care of your asset in a man, in a given manner, periodically. We can frame out all the requirements as you want, and we can give you the solution. And we have experts uh, in, Japan, in Singapore and Japan, and we can get the solution for your uh, asset uh, in a, which may be in a very stringent and difficult condition. So I have uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, this is last slide what we have, and you can see the, the asset is still uh, good content and uh, removal of the barnacles. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shekhar, uh, for your insight into the very, very big problems of underwater coatings for especially in tidal zones and coastal zones. This was one of the major problems which was discussed during the advisory meeting. And we thank you for taking this uh, paper presentation and taking the abstract and presenting the case studies. Thank you very much. Now, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I will move over to the next speaker, Mr. Tarun Mishra. Who is a co founder and chief strategy officer of Detect Technologies? The founder and director of Detect Technologies, Mr. Tarun Mishra, oversees strategies for global expansion as a chief strategy officer. 
with an aim to re-engineer industrial processes and accelerate the path to industry 4.0 with cutting edge technologies. Mr. Tarun has incorporated DTAC technologies in 2016. Today, its products are being adopted globally across process industries, being deployed at large global enterprises such as Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Reliance, Bharat Petroleum, Tata Steel, Coromandel, SPCL, ONGC, and more. With this, I would now like to invite Mr. Tarun to make his address. Over to you, Mr. Tarun. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you one and all for uh, giving the opportunity to present uh, something about intelligent corrosion monitoring in industries. That's been the focus area uh, of many things that are happening in the world today. So what I'll do is I'll start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so Detect is a company which sort of has brought some of the smartest talents across the world uh, to solve the most challenging problem in various different aspects of large enterprises uh, globally. Um, if you look at Detect today, uh, we are serving at about six countries. We are a company that started out in India. Uh, now we are active in Singapore, USA, Indonesia, Canada, and Middle East. Overall, we are serving about 93 sites and are serving about 47 plus large global projects. As a company, we have about 200 plus young innovators across seven different diverse technology segments. Overall, combining, we're solving a very large sort of an area for different industries, which I'm going to talk about in our coming slide. So just to start off this presentation, I want to start with a thought. This is a thought that was told to me by one of uh, the mentors when we started the company is uh, imagine a future where industries will only have a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog and the dog will be there to ensure that nobody enters the industry. Bringing a level of automation to the degree that this kind of a vision gets achieved in various different process as well as asset and different other segments is where industries are currently moving to increase its efficiency as well as productivity. Coming forward to asset health management as one of the segments within that entire list of automation, I want to highlight some of the big areas why asset health management in these days has become very challenging. One, we have a lot of new combination of metallurgies coming in. So uh, depending on the process being more challenging uh, every day, there is a new process interdiction that puts a lot of stress on different types of metallurgies and new combination of metallurgies are coming. Stricter norms for monitoring and reporting are being adopted. That is leading to sweating of assets. So assets are getting older, they are being more worked upon and the demand for increased plant runtime is effectively happening. Therefore, the shutdowns are getting delayed overall, right? There is also a big drive towards benchmarking OPEX and CAPEX for moderation as well as optimization of these balances, right? So companies are moving more towards OPEX rather than CAPEX. The feedstock quality itself is changing. So many places the in the non-renewable sector specifically, the quality of the feedstock and the variance in the feedstock variance is effectively increasing. There are new designs being made to maximize the life of a plant, as well as the shorter turnaround durations are being demanded across the world, right? Aging assets, as well as multiple monitoring and multiple locations of sites and assets are becoming more of a challenge. So all of this combined together is creating a huge stress on the assets within industry. Now, this was not the problem 50 years or five, six decades back, but today this is not only there, but it's also increasing as the day goes by. And therefore, technologies are being adopted. So I have clubbed various types of technologies into eight segments, which industries are today sort of adopting or are in the process of adopting. One is your reliable screening tool. You need to screen various types of assets much faster than before. You need to pinpoint areas of concerns as well as quantify where exactly damages are happening and give clear recommendations right as to where exactly what is happening and what to do to repair it 
to bring intelligence into the system which is to integrate with the alarm systems extrapolation of current state as well as building intelligence in the hardware itself so that the hardware is not just giving the data but is also analyzing the data and giving some sort of a predictive uh, alert on failure of an asset bringing iot wireless contact for uh, various types of assets and something that is very interesting coming up is see through technology previously it was just x ray but now 3d digital twins sort of uh, without removing insulation or paint understanding the condition of paint having the minimalistic surface contact and therefore uh, still understand what is the condition of the surface and so on so forth bringing lighted and portable sensors having intelligent interpretation through artificial intelligence as well as predictability fuzzy logic and limited human interventions have become some of the major goals in the digital roadmap of any industry that is operating today but <clears throat> it's all not that simple what industry wants is lower costs quicker response very reliable system it fears that there will be lack of performance there will be safety concerns on the side and it also sort of needs the right amount of certification case studies very very robust roi calculations right but when the technology comes in the market the cost initially will be high the roi is also something that may not be very short term but will be medium to long term and initial trials will always be expensive the competency of personals develops over time the repeatability and the quality also is something that gets standardized for very new technology it's a process that happens and the results are sort of complex unanticipated at times it takes effort for the user to accept uh, the new technology itself right and the case studies get built on the go there are less initial takers there is a limited data that is available and the outcome is effectively there is slow adoption and continued inefficiency and industries keep talking about digitalization and automation but nothing really hits the ground because of this disconnect but globally a change has started and the change is effectively on adopting these things uh, by defining what the value and benefit is going to be so for example there is a strategy to create a strategic identity of inherent capabilities and vision of how capabilities can be employed in the coming sort of few years that are there as well as realigning all the different portfolios and focusing on new growth areas focusing on the strengths of any enterprise cultivating and hiring the right talent which has the intellect and the mindset to work with new age technologies and lastly and the most critical piece is investing many industries have already started and those who have not are starting to invest into things such as drones robotics artificial intelligence virtual reality iot etc the biggest advantage to industry to go through all those challenges and still sort of invest into this area is threefold first you have a first mover advantage that can co develop and customize products as per your working practices so you don't have to actually take a pre built product and try to force fit in your existing practices you can be the first mover who has that ability second you have increased efficiency by leveraging new technologies and creating pressure for action this brings me to this uh, particular point of how inspection or reliability as a whole is sort of changing right so inspection and reliability in terms of automation we see inspect process act as well as sort of prevent so in summary if i were to put it sense interpret correct predict and prevent that is how we broadly bucket it in terms of sensing we have emerging at technologies and advanced non destructive evaluation techniques advanced corrosion monitoring sensors few of which i'll be showing examples shift from inspection to monitoring where the era of iot is beginning and robotic inspection solutions with different drones as well as underwater robotics etc that are coming up lighter portable wireless sensors are part where the sensing aspect of asset is getting automated second is the interpretation automated processing fuzzy logic reducing human interventions all of this is sort of aspect where the interpretation of what you are sensing on asset is getting fully automated then correction correction you integrate all these interpretation with your existing erp or or have a new erp solution 
which effectively not only stores these insights but also track how the correction measures are happening on the go how the maintenance is happening on the go then predicting so once we have done all of that we can predict through continuous monitoring finding patterns using artificial intelligence computational sciences simulation can help you predict when the next failure is going to happen and finally prevent by using data analytics and cause and failure analysis right so let's see some of the examples first example is your guided wave technology guided wave technology has evolved quite a lot uh, one of the sensors that is available is uh, effectively a permanently mounted sensor this sensor is mounted on pipelines and it can generate an ultrasonic guided wave through the entire circumference of the pipe wherever there is a corrosion or there is a fault it reflects the wave back the wave goes to the receiver the receiver effectively communicates that data on the cloud and you are able to see that uh, entire insight on the dashboard directly you can also do things such as temperature correlation uh, monitoring the elbows bends and so on and so forth of course this technology has largely been on on ground piping not underground piping and not cross country pipelines things such as you know range has been a limiting factor where you have only up to 60 meters as the range um while technology has evolved to become you know sort of uh, from a normal service based lrut inspections to uh, a more sort of a robust based inspection where you can do uh, bend monitoring you can reduce the noise you can get the trends of how the corrosion is happening monitor these trends as well as reduce the false alarms so all of this has evolved but there is still sort of work going on in increasing the range and evolving this technology for cross country pipelines interstate pipelines and so on so forth right <laughs> second is your visual based intelligence in your visual based intelligence uh, artificial intelligence is being used on on photos or visuals acquired by either people or drones or cameras to understand where the corrosion is happening what is the degree and extent of the corrosion has there been cracks any kind of failures uh, insulation damages and so on so forth that has happened on these assets right so this is an example of an ai sort of inside a chimney where you are seeing that any kinds of cracks be it this kind of a minor crack which can visually easily be missed is being caught by the ai and the ai is able to predict what kinds of failures and cracks can happen um, in different kinds of things so the data can be in terabytes uh for for different types of robots and equipments that are there but uh, uh but you know effectively it is something that can be streamlined using the use of artificial intelligence second use the same ai in things such as pain damage so here we are leveraging computer vision and acquiring data using uavs for large piping sections and quantifying exactly here you are seeing in circles areas marked with pain damage so red ones are areas with severe pain damage blue ones are area with smaller pain damage so the cv is able to tell you what is the scope of entire painting in the line uh, and is also correcting that uh, before it gets too severe where a corrosion effectively leads to a leakage right so exact quantification is available quarterly audits can be made available as well as percentage of assets under corrosion risk can be ascertained at a much lower cost things such as ut thickness inspection the use of robots have effectively sort of streamlined that where drones can go into taking ultrasonic thickness surveys and identifying you know what is the risk in different areas so directly a drones can be used so here you are seeing uh, both a digital model where you have the red areas as the areas where there is heavy thickness loss green where you have areas with low thickness loss and yellow with medium thickness loss on this side you are seeing the internal confined space inspection and artificial intelligence being used to determine uh, where exactly the fault and uh, defects are there right so that kind of automation is also now possible so next application would be your process equipment so even your process equipment such as your reactors regenerators where you want to understand what is the temperature conditions on the surface for these equipments and then do quarterly audits just flying a drone or flying or taking the data manually may not be reliable so using artificial intelligence you can create the complete digital twin model and in that digital twin model 
you can effectively integrate all these data points, use AI to pinpoint where exactly the temperature is rising and then have the trends and analysis available on the digital mo model so that you can observe all the high risk, medium risk and under observation things. The same kind of capability is then leveraged into transmission towers and communication towers. These are in massive numbers. In India, we have more than 10 lakh plus uh, towers overall. More than that, in fact, I may be talking about a pessimistic number. Auditing or monitoring all these towers is an uphill task. And therefore, using computer vision, artificial intelligence, you can identify small, small defects, which even can be missed by a person, not just visually, but also from a thermal and temperature data perspective. You can do all of that with robotic automation, where there is a, a very recently Oil India Limited uh, released a news where uh, they are sort of monitoring their entire pipelines using completely automated drones. So these drones are effectively going 24 seven on top of their pipelines, finding out things such as pilferage, any kind of leakage, any kind of damages or theft, which is happening in their pipeline section. And using the artificial intelligence, they are able to see uh, that on the dashboard where, you know, they can monitor all of these happening. So this is also something that is possible today. And through a very uh, sort of uh, comprehensive architecture, uh, these all things have been deployed in various areas. So I think I'm running out of time. So I will effectively cover just one more thing, which is automated vulnerability assessment through thermography. Thermography is another evolving area where it has been used in different types of assets ranging from cable tray, flare stack, tanks, pipelines, process pipes, and so on and so forth, uh, where you take the temperature information through an automated uh, path robotics. And then the trend of this information is mapped over time. So you can understand how the temperature rise is happening in different areas of an asset. And through that, understand what is the integrity and reliability of that asset that is developing over time. So that is there all of that can of course be represented into a, a 3d sort of ar vr uh, kind of space and can even be seen in the conference room as you can see here so you can even see it in in this kind of a space where you can discuss directly the entire asset the entire plant so you're bringing the entire plant in your conference room and then sort of mapping the data on top of it so in conclusion the formula for success in Asset digitization and complete automation uh, lies in strategy, implementation, and ensuring quality. So you have to first, every enterprise has their own problem and therefore the problem has to be analyzed. The technology available has to be analyzed and whether there is a work to be done for the available technology to sort of solve the problem at hand, that has to be sort of understood. Then the new technology adoption has to be done where both client as well as the vendor working on that has to work together. And finally, the quality has to be ensured, which is through both validating technology, but also co-development and scaling of the technology um, in, in that particular enterprise that has happened, right? So that's the overall success formula that we have witnessed over the last um, uh, half a decade or so uh, in various enterprises as we have been working and scaling internationally. That is all. Uh, thank you, and I would like to open for uh, questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tarun, for your wonderful presentation. You can unshare the screen, and then there are questions which are marked in the chat box. So it will be it is being addressed to the different speakers in the chat section. First of all, uh, there is a question of on underwater painting of jetty pies. This is a question. Many details. I think this question is for Shekhar Joshi. Somebody has asked about underwater painting of jetty piles. Mr. Shekhar, there is a question also marked. Uh, can you uh, detail on the artificial intelligence of paint damage? Address to Mr. Tarun. Yeah, so for paint damage, the AI effectively detects as I sh as I showed, it is two two categories and two classification. One is your severe pain damage, other is your mild pain damage. So once the data gets acquired on the drones, the data will get processed um, on a server, and uh, the outputs will be available on a dashboard where you will get the exact coordinates and locations 
of where the severe pain damage has happened and where the minor pain damage has happened so uh, yeah there is a question addressed to mr madhusudan how critical is corrosion in cross country pipelines sir this is already explained in my the ppt that uh, how impact is taking place on the pipeline when the, the induction effect is taking place continuously on the pipelines we need to require to monitor the voltage and current density if it doesn't do that monitoring that uh, the ac voltage and current density it will be a in the short span of within the five years your pipeline will get eat away and it will cause it will cause a huge damage to the environment and the the vicinity of the area so it is very important to monitor the ac voltage and its current density mr shekhar uh, the question was the underwater painting of jetty piles can you detail you are muted sir you are muted uh, hello shika uh the question addressed to you underwater painting of jetty piles can you detail this can why so should we uh i think uh, we will write to you for the more uh, detailing hello this yes. so with this we come to the end of the session uh of first session today which was focusing on protection of the assets we will now like to move over to the next session which is focusing on successful case studies and new techniques and innovations we have speakers with us in this session mr elvin yo from nippon paint singapore great uh, mr elvin to join us uh, from different places we have mr bharat choksi cmd grand polycoats who will be the second speaker we will have subramaniam khadanga from ntpc limited and we will have mr ravi mohan dabral from ocsil So now I would like to formally welcome Mr. Elvin Yeo, Roof Protective Coatings from Nippon Paint, Singapore. Mr. Elvin has more than 20 years of experience in oil and gas as well as building and construction industry, and has worked with major companies in senior management positions. Elvin Yeo is a Bachelor of Business from Edith Cowan University, Perth, Australia. He has over 15 years of rich experience in protective coatings business workings with global brands and now Nippon Paints. Currently at Nippon Paint, Elvin is responsible for growth group PC business across Nippon Group of companies. With this, I would now like to welcome. It's a good evening at your end, uh, and it is a late afternoon at our end. <laughs> welcome and to address. Thank you, Mr. Naga. Uh, very good afternoon to every one of you, ladies and gentlemen uh, from Singapore. My time here in Singapore is uh six thirty p.m. in the evening, so it is a good, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to participate in this uh, conference uh, and to share with you a case study based on our experience uh, in the fluorocarbon raising based uh, system that was actually applied and used in several of our projects. So allow me to share screen. um are you able to see my screen you can see your screen ah okay that would be great um all right uh let me uh brief touch on the uh, protective coating portion today i would like to share with all of us uh, a fluoro carbon resin based systems uh that is essentially used for the uh, coastal coastal environment 
Okay, so uh, allow me to introduce uh, Nippon Pain, uh, a short introduction of who we are, what we do, and then follow on by a introduction of the range of protective coatings that uh, Nippon Pain carries. And then thereafter, I will go into the uh, proper topic in, in terms of the uh, fluorocarbon raising systems uh, that essentially being used uh, in some of the projects uh, where the assets are at, in the coastal uh, environment. It's so, uh, Nippon Pain, as a group, uh, we have uh, around 95 manufacturing facilities all over the region, uh, producing about 2.3 billion uh, liters of paint worldwide. Uh, as far as our market position, we are Asia number one, and this is actually uh, a statistic that was uh, that can be found in the uh, coating journal, uh, whereby uh, Nippon Paint in Asia is number one. Uh, globally, we are number four, and we operate uh, in twenty-two countries and region with an approximately twenty twenty-five. Thousand plus people speaker, uh, employees yeah, all, all over the world. So that's a snapshot of uh, a snapshot of of Nippon Paint of our presence, uh, our manufacturing facilities, uh, and the okay. number of literature of paint. Okay. That we now, as far as our presence is concerned, uh, we are we started off. Uh, the first factory was actually started in Singapore in in eighteen eighty one. And then over the years uh, to today, we have actually had uh, have presence in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, as you can see here, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Central Asia, in China, in Central Europe, and in uh, Western and Northern Europe. So this is uh, basically where our presence uh, is globally. Uh, as far as our R&D centers are concerned, we have two R&D centers. One in uh, Singapore, which uh, looks after the uh, Asian uh, R&D technology and innovation needs. And then we, we also have another uh, R&D innovation center in China, located in Shanghai, uh, where we look after the uh, group core R&D. And then also we look at uh, innovation in terms of the different various aspects of coatings, such as architectural, automotive, industrial, and uh, frontline technology. Okay. So our business segment, we cover the various uh, business segments uh, in architectural coatings, where we look at uh, coatings for home solutions. Essentially, this is uh, residential, uh, public and private uh, residential projects. Uh, we also have coatings that addresses the uh, professional or trade use, where this covers uh, very much in terms of commercial, industrial and retail uh, in the project segment. Uh, we also have coatings that cover the industrial uh, segment, where essentially uh, where protective coating comes in. Uh, we also have businesses in the automotive uh, area where we have auto refinishing paint, uh, essentially for car refinishes and, uh, o and OEM. Uh, we also do have coatings in, uh, in the marine segment where we have marine coating looking at uh, uh, FPSOs, uh, big ocean liners, cargo ships, so on and so forth. And apart from all these coatings that we have, we also have coatings that actually go beyond co the traditional coatings uh, such as uh, sealants and adhesives, uh, specialty coatings uh, for uh, spalling concrete, for uh, wood coatings, and for other technological uh, solutions. So essentially, uh, in a nutshell, these are the different business uh, segment areas that uh, we cover. So in India, in Nippon Paint India, we have three factories. Uh, one in uh, Bawao, which... Uh, which, is, which produces uh, auto refinishes. And then we have one in Mumbai, with, which looks after or, take, or produces the industrial coating aspect. And then we have uh, the other one in Chennai, which uh, produces the uh, decorative uh, coatings and, and paint. 
So these are the three uh, production uh, facilities that we have in India, basically to support our customers' requirement uh, within the India region. So this is a, a picture of, of, of our uh, uh, facility in uh, Taloja, uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, this is in the Maharashtra. Uh, forgive me if I pronounced it uh, <laughs> and not so accurate. So this is another of our facility. Okay, and the uh, nipple paint business in India, uh, essentially we have uh, coil coating, uh, powder coating and protective coating, which uh, serve the industrial or trade use. Uh, and then we have uh, interior coating, exterior coating and coatings that we look at projects, uh, typically for trade use. And then we also have marine coatings and the auto refinishes. So essentially, these are our uh, business areas in uh, India. Okay. And as far as protective coatings uh, segment in India, we cover quite a fair bit of uh, segments. We cover the OEM uh, and heavy duty equipment segment, the pre-engineered buildings, which is essentially uh, what I understand is a uh, uh, coming trend uh, in India. And then we also cover projects in, in the new build as well as the uh, maintenance. And then we have specialty coatings where we have uh, glass flake uh, polyester to look at uh, specialty uh, uh, materials where we cover uh, the oil and gas segments um, in uh, tank linings, in uh, corrosion, un corrosion uh, under insulation um, and uh, uh, applications as such. And then we also have the uh, we also cover the rail railways where you have wagons and carriages and defense equipment, uh, wind power, and also uh, pipe coatings, internal and external application in terms of uh, corrosion protection. So in under the OEM uh, segment and the HDE or heavy duty equipment segment, uh, we further drill down and look at the sub segments within. Uh, this segment where we have uh, coatings for transformer uh, and rectifiers, uh, crane, uh, construction equipments, uh, heavy duty equipments and vessels, cylinders, uh, palms, motors and valves and uh, railways and so on and so forth. Okay, so we further drill down into these OEM segments. So as far as the uh, group protective coating product range is concerned, uh, as a group, we have a couple of series where we actually group our protective coating uh, products into a, couple, into a few series, uh, namely high pond where we look at solvent-based, solvent-free products, uh, high alkyl where we look at alkyl-based uh, uh, resin products, uh, acrylic products, vinyl products, uh, fluorocarbon products where we will touch on a, we will touch on a little bit more in detail uh, further down my presentation. And then we look at Zinki, where we look at zinc-based uh, products. And within this series itself, if you look here, we have a range of products, uh, categories ranging from primers to mid-coat, top coats, chemical resistance product, high resistance, subsea, offshore, and then specialty products in terms of rust treatment, concrete treatment, and paint remover, and, and so forth. Right, so uh, these are our group range uh, applicable to, as I mentioned earlier, a series of uh, segments in terms of corrosion protection. So now I would like to touch on the uh, case study in terms of where uh, our experience are. Like uh, many a times when we look at uh, corrosion protection, we look at the primer, we look at the mid coat, and then we, we look at uh, subsequent following a top coat. Uh, to form a complete total corrosion protection solution. So essentially, many a times, typically epoxies and polyurethanes are actually being used uh, as top coats. And we typically see that most of the time as purely more for aesthetics. But uh, if, you, if you look deeper into it, uh, the finishing coat not only actually provides the aesthetic part uh, of the total system, but actually is it, it is also actually an essential part of the total system because if you have a top coat that uh, in terms of uh, shorter durability period, 
where over a period of time it breaks down, that will sort of affect the subsequent uh, code in terms as a total as a total corrosion protection system. So this is where we look at uh, fluorocarbon uh, base uh, as a top code in as a to, as a holistic and total system in terms of the whole uh, corrosion uh, protection system solution. And typically, we look at uh, coastal areas or look at areas where you have very harsh uh, environment. So I'm sure most of us would probably know a simple uh, 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 description or definition of what fluorocarbon is. is essentially, uh, most of it are actually two components, high performance based uh, chemically, chemically cured coating. And then you have, of course, the polysiloxane based system, which is uh, an essentially two component isocyanide uh, free system. And then you have, of course, which is the uh, one that which is uh, typically commonly used, which is your polyurethane, two component uh, acrylic uh, base uh, polyurethane, uh, polyurethane reason. So if you look at, at the bottom of the slide here, where we have a chart in terms of low carbon polysiloxane and polyurethane, uh, we look at the bond strength, we look at uh, in terms of QUAV, uh, in terms of the color retention, in terms of the gloss retention, retention each of these individual uh, resins uh, gives you actually a slightly different uh, uh, reading or slightly different management. And when you look at fluorocarbon uh, in terms of the uh, reading, uh, it is actually uh, way surpass the readings of the polysiloxane and polyurethane. So if you look, if we go into, into, the, into the chemical structure uh, in terms of the polyurethane, polysiloxane, fluorocarbon, uh, chemical structure. What we see here on the bottom right here, where you have uh, the different chemical bond, uh, chemical structure, uh, giving you different bond energy and the bond distance. So as we all know, the shorter the bond distance, the higher the bond energy, uh, it, it actually requires a more uh, UV energy required to actually degrade the, the, the binder. Or, or, to, or degrade the cross-linking. Thus, uh, fluorocarbon uh, base system actually gives a better performance in terms of UV resistance, uh, resulting in better color and uh, gloss uh, retention. Right. So uh, in addition to color and gloss retention that we look at, we also look at fluorocarbon in terms of its adhesion as a system. We also look at fluorocarbon in terms of its application. So on the right side of the screen, uh, in the laboratory testing, we actually apply a full system onto a panel, and then we 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 do the uh, pull out test. Uh, we varying uh, window uh, overcoating times ranging from one month to eleven months, and we did uh, subsequent pull out tests over this uh, period of time. So uh, the results has been very promising. Uh, typically surpassing the five megapascal uh, benchmark, which is typically the industry uh, gauge or industry practice. And on the right side of the screen, uh, we also look at touch up in terms of application whereby uh, this, this project that we do, is, it is actually in China, uh, where the temperature at that point in time was actually zero degrees, uh, zero to three degrees Celsius. And uh, because when we apply the fluorocarbon top coat uh, onto the as a full system, there will be situation whereby you require touch up. So, uh, and the duration of the touch up, the time when you first apply the coating and when and the time when you want to do subsequent touch up, it is actually very important because that's where you are looking at uh, schedule, you're looking at timing, when you when you're doing in a big project where time is of essence and where you need to deliver put onto a barge and then ship out to uh, whichever country that this where your asset is going to be, so this was carried out at a very low temperature uh, and it was coated over a period of three to eleven months. Uh, in terms of the in terms of the touch up, uh, it is actually uh, very, it's actually superior. We did not encounter any uh, obesity issues or in, in certain instances where you do touch up, you actually get patches. So in these instances, over a period of time, uh, we did not see any patch, any patch or any patchiness in terms of touch up. Uh, here also, we look at uh, 
uh, we do a QUAV test on the left side of the screen. You actually look at we actually look at color retention. We compare the various uh, different resins, and here you see in terms of row carbon, you actually in terms of the uh, delta E, you actually uh, it is actually narrower or, or within a narrow scope as compared to the rest of the other resin. And then on the right side here, we look if you base on a 60 degree uh, gloss retention, uh, you actually notice here in terms of fluorocarbon carbon resin, uh, compared to uh, in terms of uh, gloss loss, uh, it is actually over a period of time, uh, comparing to the other two resins, uh, the percentage of gloss loss it is actually lower. So on top of the uh, traditional typical QUAV test that we typically do in the lab. We have actually also sent uh, samples out to the United States in Arizona, whereby, you, whereby they actually put the panels on uh, to expose. And Arizona typically is in a very uh, subtropical conditions uh, where you have dry desert environment uh, in South Florida. So they have actually placed uh, uh, panels uh, exposed panels, and then they have they actually installed uh, mirrors to at the site here to actually uh, intensify the uh, sunlight or the heat ray and targeted at the uh, the uh, coating itself. So uh, that actually sort of uh, in a way you can call it accelerated, but then it is actually in an exposed uh, exposed uh, environment. So to actually uh, target intense heat on, on, onto the coating. So, so uh, this was done over a period of time. And on the left side, we actually measure the uh, delta E color, uh, color range. Uh, what you see here on the horizontal, it's the megajoules per meter square in terms of UV. And then uh, on, the, on the right side, you measure uh, uh, the uh, time. So if you can see here, the uh, blue one is the flow carbon raising. Uh, over a period of time, you look at the color delta change, uh, you actually get a smaller spectrum compared to the other two raisins. And then on the right side here, we did again a 60 degree uh, gloss, uh, where you look at the, uh, the uh, blue line, which is the uh, flow carbon raising compared to the other uh, two raisins, you actually get a lower color uh, six, uh, gloss loss and uh, the 140 megajoules per meter square when they calculate it is actually equivalent to 0 0.5 years of exposure so they tested all the way to 2800 megajoules so that in terms of mathematical calculation it sort of equates to 10 to 15 years of uh, exposure so in addition to to addition to uh, application to uh, color to gloss uh, we also look at uh, cyclic corrosion test uh, where we tested in accordance to ISO 12944 in the offshore environments similar to your NOSOC M5, M501 whereby they actually now uh, streamline the standard into ISO 12944 so we, we, we did that over 24 25 cycles or 4200 hours uh, based on a zinc rich epoxy primer, a MIO mid coat, and using a fluorocarbon uh, top coat. Okay, and we do a scrap test. So, in, 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 in conclusion, uh, we basically concluded that the uh, properties of the fluorocarbon based, uh, resin based uh, system uh, provides an excellent addition and bond strength. It uh, gives us a faster curing time. It provides a better, uh, excellent color and gross retention, which, which typically I think most of us here we neglect, uh, although it costs a little bit, bit more. But if you look at the longer term in terms of the durability, it actually provides a better uh, finishing coat uh, with a better longer durability period uh, before it breaks down and, and, and gets into the subsequent coat. Okay. In terms of interval, it's better interval coating time. Uh, ability to cure uh, at low temperatures, uh, opacity, better opacity, or no opacity issues. And in terms of application as a touch-up, um, very, very uh, no, no patchiness was found. 
So we have actually done uh, applications for port crane where we actually spoke to our client and uh, to say that, look, uh, we, will off we would like to propose and offer you a fluorocarbon based system. And uh, we've shown them all the, test uh, all the tests that we have done. And these are some of the applications that we have applied uh, in terms of port, uh, port cranes. We've also uh, done some applications in uh, bridges uh, using the fluorocarbon based uh, resin system as well. And then we also have also done uh, fluorocarbon applications in uh, buildings, typically in the infrastructure segment, uh, where you look at the facades, uh, airports, uh, hospitals, medical centers, sports centers, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. And uh, my colleague, uh, Prasad, I think he's also, in, uh, he's also present in this meeting. So I understand that uh, there are so uh, three or two or three other sessions going on, and there will be a Q and A session right at the end of this uh, session. So if you have uh, any questions or any uh, queries that you would uh, like us to address, uh, you're most welcome to do so. Please feel free. Uh, you can actually write to my colleague, Mr. Prasa. Uh, he's the director for protective coating and powder coatings in uh, Nippon Paint, India. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. And uh, it is again uh, my honor from Singapore to be able to share uh, our case study with you, uh, with your ladies and gentlemen in India. All right, with that, I want to thank you very much. Uh, over thank to you. you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvin. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for joining us all the way <laughs> from uh, Singapore. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, it was, was a pleasure to host you and we look forward to meeting you in person uh, because of COVID, this event is happening online, but the other nine events have always happened. So we look forward to hosting you in uh, India and have one-to-one -one interactions. Thank you for your valuable time and inputs and I will be posting the questions at the end of the session. And if there are any questions further which comes to us, we will be emailing to your team it was wonderful to interact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is an honor. <laughs> now we will like to move over to the next speaker, uh, which is Mr. Kadanga uh, from NTPC. Mr. Kadanga, uh, he is uh, HODP Civil EOC uh, from Noida, NTPC Limited. B Civil, MRC, Jaipur, 1986, and MTech Structure, IT, Bombay from 1988. 32 years of design experience in power plant structures, design experience in rotating equipment foundations such as TGA fans. And welcome, Mr. Kadanga. We are having a parallel power conference, which is going on under the leadership of Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, Director of Projects, NTPC. And we are very pleasured to host you to address the, what are the corrosion problems in the power industry and what are the challenges and how we overcome? What do you, Mr. Katanga? Thank you. Uh, myself, uh, S. Katanga. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak in such a great, or, uh, great occasion. Uh, I am sharing my screen uh, is the screen uh, visible yes it is visible yeah fine Uh, I will cover uh, some of the aspects uh, related to corrosion that uh, we are facing. And uh, uh, in any project, which may be either industrial, residential,
or commercial significant amount of investments are made which require substantial time from conceiving to actualizing the project these projects in general involve investment of fund design and in turn lead to prosperity and development of the nation selecting the correct material and optimal corrosion protection is a vital part of the project design at the initial stage which will ensure the desired life span of the project all project components based on their functionality are in general exposed to environments such as air water and chemicals present in the soil aggressive environment reduces the life of the material and in turn lead to shorter life span outages and additional investment for rectification all such troubles can be avoided with appropriate corrosion protection measures some of the measures in general are paintings and coatings cathodic protection corrosion protection requires the state of the art knowledge for metallurgical engineering material engineering civil engineering coating requires uh, knowledge of chemical engineering mechanical engineering for assessment of wear and tear as per estimate the annual worldwide cost of only metallic corrosion is only dollar 2 trillion significant amount is uh, spent for the protection of the corrosion measures in case we are able to avoid corrosion significant amount we will be able to save some of the corrosions which have happened in some of our <coughs> facilities is here this is a facility where there is a constant it is subjected to constant uh, moisture the handrail has corroded very badly and you can see the rust as well as the holes in the pipes and this is also a staircase uh, handrails this is also corroded very badly this is also staircase uh, this uh, staircase uh, railings and uh, angle edge protection angles this is one of the cooling tower concrete surface where the reinforcement has corroded in case of a typical thermal power plant of 2 into 260 660, 660 megawatt you need the total structural steel involved is of the order of 1 lakh 12000 metric ton assuming the cost of uh, structural steel painting is of the order of 5500 rupees per metric ton the cost involved is around 60 crore per each plant of size 2 into 660 megawatt scope for future development maintain a maintenance painting scheme for already erected and corroded high rise structures some of the areas uh, where improvement are required are uh, i have identified that is maintaining a painting scheme maintenance in painting scheme for already erected and corroded uh, uh, high rise structure in case of a high rise structure it is very difficult to climb up to the top and uh, carry out painting as well as uh, sand blasting and other activities uh, which are the normal practice uh, for uh, uh, application of paints so we have to find out a system how we can apply the paint and we what what should be the component of the paint so that it will last uh, uh, very it will give a very lasting solution painting for underground concrete foundations for protection against aggressive environment these are some of the areas where uh, further research as well as uh, uh, contribution from the industry is required an effective corrosion protection schemes for steel and concrete structure exposed to continuous water vapor and flue gases in case of thermal power plants there are some structures where there is a continuous it is subjected to water vapor such as uh, cooling towers it can be natural draft uh, cooling tower or induced draft cooling towers these uh, structures are normally made of concrete and these are subjected to continuous uh, water vapor throughout the life of the lifespan of the project 
so this induces a lot of uh, corrosions in the concrete as well as the structural steels uh, which are uh, uh, involved in this uh, structures so significant damage and uh, occur so some sort of effective uh, mechanism is required uh, to prevent uh, such sort of uh, corrosions further different uh, there are uh, different manufacturers who have different uh, solutions different uh, category of products and uh, different uh, mechanism to applications so have the same problem that the need has to be that is a need for a comprehensive compilation of the category of different products for same problem from the association of paint manufacturers Right. So, so this will not only help uh, in selecting the right uh, uh, product and it will give a very uh, quick uh, knowledge to the users for their problem and uh, a solution to their problems. In case of uh, recently we are going for uh, flue gas dis desulfurization system in chimneys. So as per environmental norms for new stations, the permissible sulfur dioxide in flue gas is only 100 ppm. In the process of FGD, the flue gas temperature reduces to about 60 degrees centigrade. Flue gases from wet stacks carry acidic liquid droplets. These droplets in generally evaporate before falling into the ground. But sometimes when these droplets are large, these droplets fall on the ground and uh, on the surface of the structures and concrete which are adjacent to chimney. So this uh, leads to, the, in this process, the structures are subjected to uh, acidic environment and uh, an effective corrosion system is uh, required to counteract the acidic uh, environment. So, even though substantial research and development for new products in the field of corrosion protection is taking place, as we experience new challenges, new products, and cost-effective application technology is required to make our project last longer and longer without worrying for damage due to corrosion. These products must have following in general, meet the environmental norms to protect our planet, and also this product has to be cost effective such that these products are affordable and do not burden our society. So thank you. This is what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Kadanga, um, yes. for uh, addressing the problems of corrosion in the power industry. We definitely, uh, corrosion is a very, very critical problem in oil, gas, refining and power industry. That's the reason that we had incorporated a surface engineering which comes in the center of all the parallel four conferences which are going on to address what are the problems and what are the lacunas and what are the challenges. And we have people from the industry, from paint and coatings uh, industry, who, who will look forward to working together and in future also to Kemtech Foundation to address this problem. Thank you very much. You can unshare your screen, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Bharat Choksi, CMD Grand Poly course. Mr. Bharat Choksi, a chemical graduate and first generation visionary entrepreneur based at Vazodra, who started his journey from kitchen to present business empire. He has carved a special place for his group of companies with his credit of first and early introduction of some of the novel technologies like polyurethane, elastomeric coatings like polyurea, isocyanate free coatings, CNSL based phenyl alkamine hardness. He is a recipient of Outstanding Entrepreneur Award by CII Western Region. With this, I would long like to invite Mr. Bharat Choksi for his address. Mr. Choksi. Yeah, I, I'll just... Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. 
Good, good. Uh, let me just share my presentation before I start. Yeah, just because I, I think that. Um, Can you see my screen? Yes. You yes. are? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great, great. Can you see the presentation? Uh, new new technique and innovation? Yes. Yes. We can. Pardon? We can. You we can, can okay. see that. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, okay. So, uh, good evening once again, uh, organizers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jatubai, Maulik, Batraji, for giving us this opportunity uh, to present uh, our topics on new technique and innovations for surface coating technology, basically. It was a good presentation by uh, Sekhar Joshi, Dinesh Kumar, Alvin, and uh, Kadanga, right? Am I pronouncing properly? Yes. And Mr. Kadanga. It was very good, very good uh, insight. We got it. Uh, now, I, uh, my topic is uh, new techniques and uh, innovations, physically. So, the contents are uh, the background of innovations, need for innovation, drivers for innovation, solutions, and challenges ahead. So I'll go by one by one. But as a human being, our nature is to innovate whatever uh, we are doing, basically. So the time we are born, uh, we are always looking for, for the innovation. Our mind is continuously working for innovation. And that is why I think one of the movies, Dialogue says, Ke Dil Mange More, right? So innovation is the practical uh, implementation of our ideas, which not only gives you the new products and of, of course the services, and also it can bring a lot of uh, improvements in uh, both the goods and uh, services. Take the example of the technology. So we had a uh, telephone, we had a camera, we had a computer, we had a tape recorder and now just imagine that in just one smartphone you have got everything inside so this is how the technology is uh, moving and this is how the innovation takes place through the uh, genius mind of a human being take the another example of uh, innovations for our traveling so how we were traveling earlier and now uh, we, we have gone up to electric car and to my knowledge, I think the flying cars are going to be the next solution of our uh, uh, the technology and the innovations uh, because they, I, I'm sure that there will be a flying car soon in the market uh, for our uh, traveling purpose. <clears throat> Let's talk about the uh, protective coating uh, movements. I said when I say moments with uh, earlier, people noticed that there is a corrosion taking place and uh, so they, they started using the peace oil, all kinds of oils and then came the natural resins like salac. Then uh, from uh, natural resins we moved to alkyd resins, TPA, then came the epoxy polyurethanes. And uh, now the uh, new age has come for the elastomeric uh, 
polyurea, polysiloxin, and uh, fluorocarbons, DTM, no VOC. And it, it, you know, it's all uh, a lot of breakthroughs in the new technologies happening as far as the coating uh, technology is concerned because our assets are getting more and more expensive and our environment is getting more and more polluted. So we need more and more stronger system with low VOC. As we have seen the breakthrough in the coating technology, our uh, coating specifications are also getting uh, more and more uh, versatile and universe. So earlier we had a local standard like IS, BIS. Now globally accepted standards are also now um, uh, taking place from ISO 12944 to C1, C5 to CX. These are the new latest uh, specifications which is uh, which are uh, being developed and that helps everyone to develop the coating as per this uh, new uh, coating specification. As we move forward for the coating uh, technology, there are a lot of uh, improvements in our test methods. Earlier, uh, uh, it was salt spray condensation, UV resistance. Now the cyclic corrosion has come. AMIQA is another uh, UV uh, test which has been uh, there now, autoclave test, provision test, standard like HAVA, PREP, WRAS, API, RP. All these uh, new standards are also and the test methods which are uh, getting more and more popular, which is also creating a lot of pressure on coating manufacturer to, uh, I think, uh, adhere to this standard, which is good for uh, maintaining the quality. And uh, it is it is really good that all customers are also now asking for all these uh, test certificates from international lab, which is also a lot of uh, new, uh, that has led to a new technology, uh, innovations and test methods, I think. Why we have to, what are the drivers of innovation, basically, in the coating technology? Basically, changing demand of the customers, they are looking for higher life, more life of the coating and effects, basically. Due to the high project cost, they want to apply coating for, which lasts for 10 years, 15 years. Now, we have seen the presentation of fluorocarbons recent, uh, just before my presentation where we can give the guarantee all the way up to 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years also, depending on the coating systems. Government regulations are also calling for the innovations, global entry barriers like REACH, ROHS, uh, and the, also the environmental impact and pollution. What are the probable solutions, basically? So, Usually, now we are talking about uh, water-based uh, products, but uh, that is uh, very difficult to handle by the customers also. So, people are now focusing more on the high solids and low VOC or zero VOC products, basically. Uh, fast drying products offering the fast turnaround time because uh, labor is getting expensive. The failure rates due to the applications are also more so they want a better product, fast turnaround time and fast drying product. Also, they are looking for minimum surface preparation because everywhere sandblasting or water blasting is not possible to do. So direct to metal, ready to use products, they are looking for high durable systems uh, in terms of chemical resistance they are looking for. And also they are looking for, some of them are also looking for the green technology. But any technology solution that is green should not should not be such that its environmental impact is actually higher than the non-green technology, which uh, people are, have started experiencing because uh, treating water-based uh, coating at the customers and are getting uh, more expensive, more difficult because of the pollution control, local bodies, regulations and everything. What are the probable solutions from... Uh, GP's basket of products. 
So we have we have focusing on uh, elastomeric products like uh, polyurethane elastomeric, polyurea elastomeric, polyaspartic. Uh, also, we have uh, particularly for weather resistance. So these are all the products which are hundred percent solid, non-polluting, easy to apply. Uh, not easy to apply. You need a special gun to apply. But it it really it quick it dries very quickly, and uh, offers a very long uh, life to the to protect your assets, whether it is uh, concrete or metal or whatever it is. Also, we have a different technology of uh, GPA Tetra Steel, which is uh, quite a good, very good resi weather resistance and uh, high chemical resistance. And we do have uh, products which can offer almost all kind of acid resistance uh, and uh, alkali resistance and hydrocarbon resistance products which we are working on so that you don't have to apply again and again uh, this uh, uh, products and your uh, assets are protected for a very long time basically. So a lot of innovations are happening in terms of uh, technology and uh, Grand Polycodes basically is investing a lot of uh, resources into the R&D, also performance measuring instruments we keep on buying and we keep up to, up to date uh, uh, as far as the coding technology is concerned. Different challenges are there uh, all throughout and uh, right now our challenges are our non-availability of the raw materials. Most of the coating, uh, I think, companies are facing that. So a lot of innovations are going on with everybody to substitute the one uh, raw material with another raw material because of the supply chain has totally disturbed the whole world. And so our coating, tech, uh, our coating uh, industry is also getting affected with this. And uh, But the only constant in the world is change, I think. So I, we will have to adapt the new raw materials, new challenges, and uh, keep on innovating ourselves and uh, give the customer satisfaction that is important uh, with the uh, new innovations and technology. So I think with this, uh, I'll, uh, my uh, presentation comes to an end. Thank you so much once again to the organizer and for giving me this uh, platform to present our grand poly course. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Choksi, for your wonderful address and your closing line, which is very important. Only constant in world is the change. When we started, uh, if we look back that oil and gas, the last event, which happened from 4th to 6th of March, 2020, we had never imagined that we would be organizing an on-ground online exhibition and conference. That was right. the last exhibition which happened in India. After this, we had the COVID pandemic. And then we had to do two events, Chemtech series and this. And change is the very important, which has told us yes. about the technology. Uh, we would yes. request you to unshare your screen so that we can go to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now we move over to very important speaker also for today's Mr. Ravi Mohan Dabral, the Business Development Director, Europe and CEO India, OCL Europe. With more than 16 years of experience in advanced material sector, Mr. Dabral has been responsible for establishing and promoting OCL's business in Europe, India, Middle East and Singapore for last six years. During the time, he has been instrumental in successfully partnering with more than 500 organizations for co-development of advanced graphene-based formulations and commercializing more than 100 projects across the industries and region. With this, I would now like to welcome Mr. Tabral for his address. Thank you so much, Mr. Nagar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me try now to uh, share my screen. Um, uh, can you see my screen? It is showing, started to share, yes. Okay, can you share, see the first uh, 
Yes. That's right. That's great. That's great. Let me see if I can put it into uh, uh, the mode. Mm -hmm. All right, I hope you all can see my screen now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Ravi Dabral. Um, for those who have attended these uh, sessions uh, with me, past sessions, uh, you would know that uh, um, Oxial works with uh, nanotechnology. Primarily, we are world's biggest uh, graphene uh, nanotube uh, producing company with a presence in more than 20 countries. And we have uh, been working for with more than uh, 500 different kinds of formulation and material altogether. So uh, when it comes to uh, working with formulations, we our experience is quite widespread. Uh, but today I have tried to make this presentation more about uh, a very specific uh, topic, uh, which concerns uh, uh, the same interest of this exhibition, which is oil, uh, gas, and power segment. So I would uh, only focus on this in this presentation on uh, how graphene nanotubes bring benefits for industrial coating, particularly in oil, uh, gas, and uh, power sector. This is just a uh, formal disclaimer that whatever presentation uh, information I have shared here is, um, is, is, is a confidential information for the scope of this uh, presentation only, not to be quoted elsewhere. So I would start with something of a new trend, what uh, we are seeing for anti-static uh, coating and uh, lining and different other kinds of uh, protective uh, coating, so to say. Yeah. Uh, recently, there have been several incidences across the globe which have left the engineers um, surprised to how the fire took place, to how the incidents particularly took place. A lot of the farm, fuel farm tanks, uh, a lot of pipelines which are transporting extremely flammable material, although sometimes they don't have any, um, sometimes they are uh, not having uh, something uh, in a gaseous form or some, something with extremely low vapor pressure uh, passing through it, uh, still get a small spark and uh, catch fire. And uh, we use, after the incidents has taken place, uh, the engineers usually uh, keep wondering what would have happened, how would that uh, charge would have uh, uh, started in the first place, yeah? It's primarily a tribological charge or a, or a static charge which takes, uh, which gets generated uh, when two surfaces uh, rub. In cases of extremely flammable material like fuel, the two surface could be air and uh, the surface of uh, the tank lining itself. Since most of, not most, since all of the thermoset and thermoplastic coatings that is done of or all kind of paint for that instance is inherently insulative. So there is always a chance of static uh, charge production. Now, to avoid this kind of a charge, two kind of technologies are primarily used. One is the old one, which is grounding the tanks in a certain way and then inspecting those groundings. Yeah. This method is not exactly what we call as a foolproof method, because if you have not grounded or inspected perfectly, then there may be a chances of the overall conductivity being compromised. There may be a chance of a uh, spark being generated. The second and newer method is making the coating itself anti-static. This could be once again coating or the lining. What is the benefit? Benefit is the, the prime one is it's foolproof. So once you have coated, you can be assured that the coating now is not inherently insulative. The coating now is 
antistatic or conductive. So there would be significantly reduced risk of fire and explosion. And hence, there would be minimized people and in injury and production losses. I don't have to say much about it. This is uh, already very, very clear. There are a few more advantages of using graphene, particularly in these coatings. Conductive coatings you can get by adding certain polymers, inherently conductive polymers, or something as simple as conductive carbon inside it. But with graphene, there are certain peculiar advantages which I'll be co covering in next few slides. These coatings uh, are already governed by one or other kind of industrial standard. Although I have to say, I haven't seen much of these anti-static linings or coatings in fuel farms in India as such. I have seen a lot of them being done in China, in Europe and US. It is mandated that if you have a, a tank farm, that has to be done with a conductive coating. But once again, I'm, I, I, I really hope this trend comes to India also. Uh, the coatings particularly uh, have to be uh, very, very uh, stringently, I would say, conductive, and they have to be compatible with uh, common flammable fuels. They have to be compatible with uh, unleaded gasolines, with a lot of biomaterial inside. I'm talking about biodiesel. And not only that, in case the kind of intermediate, intermediate is changed, in case the kind of the fuel is changed, if you are changing from one fuel to other, from crude to biodiesel to jet fuel, the coating should withstand everything and the cyclic, uh, the cyclic variation between temperatures. A couple of companies like PPG and Jodan already have these coatings. And there are some other examples we have noticed uh, globally in, uh, in, in ATEX environment, where these coating can be primarily very helpful in avoiding a lot of damage. One is as a tank line, as, as I've already mentioned. Second is uh, in any chemical processing plant, then in uh, any kind of refining environment, in electronic manufacturing, because in electronic manufacturing, you need a very static charge-free environment, otherwise, all kinds of memories uh, have the exposure of getting corrupted. Yeah. In food processing plants, particularly powder processing plants, because uh, with powder, there's always a risk of something called as a powder explosion, which is very, very dangerous. Any powder processing unit would know. And then there is a kind of conductive floor coating option also available. So wherever you have an ATEX environment, you would like to have the conductive flooring done and any kind of military and government facilities where you have to avoid the static charge. It would be also worthwhile to share that when you make a coating conductive or anti-static from insulative, you also make it to an extent dust-free. This is rather a new concept in the industry because a static charge generates up to 40% of all the dust it catches up to 40% of the, all the dust, a whole system catches. So if you, have, if, you, if you have a conductive coating, it would catch about up to 40% less dust than an insulative coating, just because of the static charge. So how particularly graphene nanotube helps, as I mentioned in the first slide, they, have, they, they give you three, three very important advantages. The first is conductivity, yes, but you can get conductivity with carbon as well as some other polymers also and mica also. Second is with graphene nanotube, it is possible to make these coatings white or light colored, which enables you to do the visual inspection of integrity of coating. This is proving to be an extremely effective and very popular uh, quality among the inspectors because uh, of course the first thing is to visu visually inspect the coating. With black coatings and coatings with carbon, you cannot do that. Second thing is the mechanical properties are significantly increased when you use graphene nanotube in any polymer. In case you compare 
a coating with carbon inside it and a coating with graphene nanotube inside it, you would find much higher strength, any kind of strength, if it is adhesive strength or it, if it is resistant to corrosion, both are significantly increased. So these two additional properties which graphene nanotube bring to the table make them a very unique and very valuable proposition. Also, I would like to add, adding graphene nanotube is not really as expensive as it is supposed to be since now there are companies like Oxel which produce graphene nanotube at commercial scale. Now, a little bit more about graphene nanotubes for all those who are hearing about graphene nanotubes for the first time. Basically, graphene is a single layer of carbon bonded together in sp2, sp3 hybridization, or one carbon in a, in a much more layman's language, you can say is bonded to three other carbon atoms. Yeah? You take this sheet of graphene and you roll it into a tube with the diameter of tube being 1.6 nanometer, approximately nanometer, and length greater than five micron. It becomes single wall carbon nanotube or graphene tube. The wall thickness, once again, is just one atom of carbon thick. So these are really nanomaterial in their, in their finest form in, in nanostructure. Hence, is it much easier to disperse them inside any polymer and see their effect all through the polymer volume. This, if you are a formulator, is a very important property. That means whatever product size, whatever batch size you are producing, it will be extremely homogeneous because the mixing is done, the nanotube gets dispersed inside and form their own 3D conductive network inside any polymer. So you get the electrical conductivity and electrical conductivity is also without any hotspot. There is no chances of being more in one part and being less in another part because it gets dispersed at a nano level. Then the advantage of color, since nanotubes are used literally in part per millions, you have to use 200, 250 or 500 part per millions of nanotubes. There's the possibility to get color as well as conductivity, which is not seen usually with carbon. If we have seen most of the conductive coatings or antistatic coatings, we have seen black coatings. But with nanotubes, you can have a lot of colors options. Then as I mentioned, as you can see, with, in comparison to the neat formulation with nanotube, the impact resistance does not go down. The crack resistance does not go down because of unique morphology of nanotubes. If you compare it with anything else like mica or carbon, you would see there is a significant drop in mechanical properties and in, in particularly impact and crack resistance, which also lead to compromising of corrosion. It gives very stable chemical resistance. In some cases, we have seen even better chemical resistance after aging. So it is stable at crude oil at 40 degrees Celsius, gasoline at room temperature, ethanol and water. So just to summarize, the key benefits are the consistent quality of coating in large industrial size batches. The, the resistance and the conductivity remains stable over time. You need extremely low dosages and you can have Ease of application, it's not too difficult to use because it doesn't affect the formulation as such. The formulation remains as fluid, as thixotropic as you have or originally planned it to be. And there is a limited influence on rheology. So you don't have to add too much solvent to use it. And then add to it the white and light colors which are possible, which are really favorable in any kind of an industrial environment where, would you, where you would like to visually inspect it. So there are a few cases uh, of uh, which I can share with you. These are already available on our website, www.tubeball.com, where we would show uh, some commercial in-place in tank farms, which have been coated by uh, coatings having graphene nanotube inside it. So we replaced conductive mica there. Conductive mica can be very, very expensive and these formulation can be extremely expensive. So in turn, in these cases, Tubeball helped Graphene nanotube help in reducing the overall cost of painting and repainting at the, at the same time, 
making the solution much more technically beneficial and viable. We, our oxyl, oxyl is oxygen, carbon, silicon, and aluminum, just in case you were wondering. We were, our company was founded in 2009. We have more than 1,500 client partners and are present globally. In case you have any more inquiries, any more questions about it, please feel free to contact us. This is my email ID, and this is the email ID of the product developer. Also, you can visit www.tubeball.com to see much more of our commercial application cases. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Debra, uh, for detailed presentation and very informative. Uh, and really, it was informative in the sense that uh, you explained the full form of OCSIL. That's even I was wondering, though it is a second interaction that we are having. Uh, so thank you again. You can unshare your screen. So sure. Now I with this we come to the close of this two days engaging program. So I'm opening the floor. Uh, what how we would like to conclude before we conclude? Uh, I will go back to the beginning of this program where two uh, months back where we had the advisory meetings, two rounds of advisory meetings, and we were discussing about what should be the theme of the surface engineering program. It was innovation through collaboration in reducing corrosion in oil, gas, and power industry, which was uh, extensively on 5th August and on 17th September, we had engaged in discussions. Innovation is very key. And through the collaborative efforts, which were discussed that we engage all the stakeholders right from, from the ONGC, from Gale, from Indian Oil, from NTPC, from the pigments, from nanotechnology, to the paints and industrial coating manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, formulators, raw materials, to see how do we can address this problem. We would like to have invite one note by everybody before I uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Batra sir for his validatory address. So we would like to have one important takeaway or a quote from each of our esteemed panelists uh, about their takeaway for this theme, innovation through collaboration. So first I would like to have uh, Mr. Shekhar Joshi or uh, anybody, Mr. Prasad is there from uh, Nippon. Uh, sorry, Mr. Nagar, I missed your question. I was saying that we had this theme of innovation through collaboration in reducing corrosion in oil, gas and power industry. So the main idea is that how is we would like to end this conference with a closing note on how, how Nippon is innovating to help the, reduce the corrosion in the oil, gas, and power industry. So a closing note from your end. Yes. What? So certainly, I mean, as we all are aware that, you know, it's been uh, quite a long time that uh, we have been uh, suffering with this corrosion issue and a lot of uh, discussions have been going on. But I think, uh, you know, it's a high time that we, as a, at the India level specific, I will say that we really uh, look into this particular problem, addressing, uh, you know, what are the corrosion issues, why are they occurring, making the right selection of the paint. There are a lot of good technologies which are available uh, in the market. Uh, company like us in Nippon Paint, you know, we are very much uh, pleased to bring in uh, all the latest technologies which are uh, available uh, at our global uh, uh, product range. So I think it's a good collaborative, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this platform really provides a good uh, access to have uh, the interaction and uh, let's uh, looking forward to uh, you know have some meaningful uh, takeaway from this uh, that uh, you know as an industry we come together and mitigate uh, these corrosion related issues. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ravi. Uh, uh, in terms of the nanotech 
nanotechnology and graphene and tech linings your closing note sure um, i would like to state that uh, via this conference we have uh, there is something very particular about this conference that the whole value chain is here right uh, from the additive manufacturer to the paint formulators to uh, the users of uh, paint and a lot of uh, approvers also so uh, it's it's um, it's a really good platform to decide and to conceive innovation really so if you find any good technology nano or otherwise all through the value chain i believe uh, please do approach any one of us i believe it's not only the seller's uh, uh, job or responsibility or onus to uh, to sell innovation ideally the innovation should be not sold it should be accepted so uh, from uh, from the whole value chain i would humbly request if you find anything innovative sometimes the seller really doesn't have an idea where would this whole uh, uh, puzzle uh, part fit in the whole picture and he has a he just has the innovation in his hand he is not able to put it somewhere and a lot of innovations get failed just because of that because because the innovator doesn't have the buy in from the whole value chain so if you find any any place any application or any need or any trend which is being used elsewhere and you would like to use it here with yourself please do approach us we together can innovate and bring a lot of new good technologies to uh, this forum and to india thank you mr mayesh has joined in from uh, brewer uh, bharat sir your closing note if you are uh, there uh, so and uh, even we have uh, mr khadanga uh, there with us so any closing note Mr. Bharat Chokshi should be there. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, the, your closing your, note. Yes. Your closing note about as we come to the close of the uh, conference, we say that uh, the, with every end there is a new beginning, and yes. with uh, every new beginning there is a change. Uh, so your uh, closing note on this theme, what we have said, innovation to collaboration, and how we can reduce the corrosion, uh, and this so your closing notes sir but uh, you closed it very early i before the com products came you closed it so uh, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah, I so, was, uh, batra ji i think uh, this is a excellent event uh, you people are really organizing uh, uh, because the manif the users manufacturer specifying agencies they all come on one platform address the upcoming challenges and uh, the interaction and the knowledge which we are getting through this platform is really really superb i think we should have more such events and uh, more and more participants should be encouraged to join this platform and uh, as as we know okay, this has become a new innovative uh, tool technology again that we are all able to meet although we are far apart from each other right that's right so so this is i think we should have more such uh, events that's what i personally feel and uh, i wish you all good luck and uh, let's have uh, let's continue this uh, kind of uh, Uh, events yes uh, that's what i feel uh, that this my uh, remark on this closing yeah thank you thank you so much mr khadanga uh, yeah good evening to all of you uh, am i audible <coughs> yes sir uh, this uh, uh, conference has given a very good uh, platform uh, for the manufacturers of technology and uh, also to users uh to interact uh, with each other and to understand the technology available i really appreciate the effort uh, taken by chemtech uh, for organizing uh, this uh, this uh, nice uh, uh, conference thank you all mr madhusudan if you are there yeah 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 i am no closing note uh 
yeah it is a wonderful session and uh, we thanks to one chemtech also bringing all of them on one platform the users and manufacturers and the new technology uh, of the upcoming what is happening in the industries that is also it is coming to know uh, as as a user i am coming to know what are the new innovative things are coming in the market and how the things are improving uh they uh, like we are used to say 3 years warranty now we are talking about 10 years warranty that kind of technology also we are not aware actually in the present uh, present scenario also though from this uh, conference i come to know that such products also is available even for a longer period so definitely we will uh, put up this to our management also to use these products to our pipelines for the external protection against the corrosion and uh, this uh, i also it is a wonderful program of this uh, one of the program i am just watching that is that uh, with, the, with the drones how the inspection is being done for the tanks that is also it is useful to our oil and gas and with this i thanks to the sudanshu also uh, with uh, organizing in such a way and uh, bringing all of them in together though we are sitting very far away and we bringing into one platform is a uh, digitalization thank you very much sudanshu ji thank you uh, mr madhusudan and thank you all uh, before i hand over to uh, batra sir for his uh, valedictory address we would be meeting soon but uh, we will be since covid has uh, really reduced we will be meeting on ground we will be having face to face interactions where we can meet each other each other greet each other learn from each other network with each other and we have the chemtech series of the which is the world second biggest process industry show happening in february hopefully everything will well and we will like to meet you in person uh, we would like to thank uh, mr rp pande uh, sir who had the, was heading the advisory committee he could not join because of the board meeting we would like to sincerely thank uh, all the board members and most sincerely i would like to thank batra sir the convener for the entire event who helped us bring together this wonderful event and over to you sir patra sir for your closing note and valedictory notes thank you thank you thank you naga sir uh, i would like each and every person who is listening to me to make a note of 25th 26th february next year because that's where 22 uh, to 25th sir 22 to 25th sorry so i have already made a note in my book and uh, those people who could not participate like in genius india we should make sure that they come in classification society like bv dnb and uh, uh, indian classification society register we we should get them here so that this the consultants and the approvers are also there and I, my my suggestion is that please uh, uh keep reminding about this date because there are too many events which take place to 22nd to 25th of february we meet uh the uh the, some, some of the manufacturers like mr bharat chokshi uh did not give details but next time we should encourage them to give out details of their products so that we can really make use of them and we, we will have a bigger event uh on in february next year Uh, thank you very much for everything uh, the efforts which have gone by when mr nagar and mr shetty are worth uh, commending thank thank you all for the all the speakers he has already said and the participant there are a large number of uh, delegates which are there and uh, so let's let's hope that we will have a much better uh, conference physical conference in february thank you very much and all the best thank you sir with this we formally close the uh, today's surface engineering and corrosion control thank you all for your support with without which the event would not have taken place thank you to all the delegates who are listening to this event thank you all panelists all the board members thank you all the partners who made this event possible thank you sir with this we would okay, like thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir